Welcome everyone. It's KP Khalsa here. We're uh, today we're having a very general Q and A session regarding the um, herb course coming up at Yoga Veda, Ayurvedic herbalism, and uh, then any other questions you have about Ayurvedic herbalism in general, Ayurveda uh, in in the broad sense, and any other questions that you want to ask. I'm waiting just a second because I don't know if we're going to have someone is speaking, but um, nothing's coming through. So. Uh, I'm waiting just a moment and to see if we're going to have any other representative from uh, Yoga Veda. So we're just uh, on hold very briefly. Hello. Hi. Well, I'm not sure if we're going to have any other representatives from Yoga Veda on uh, or not, but uh, we'll go ahead and get started. If they come on, we'll welcome them and then they can participate to whatever extent uh, they choose to. So it's a wide open Q&A session. I'm here just to, at your disposal, your chance to pick my brain. We can talk about the details of the upcoming class, anything else that you want to talk about. So first question. Okay, well, that ended our Q&A session pretty quickly. So again, we'll wait a moment. Maybe I could tell you briefly about the herb course that's coming up. In spring term, uh, we're going to be uh, discussing Ayurvedic herbalism and our class meets at uh, noon Pacific time, which would be three o'clock, this same time for you on uh, Thursdays. We have 10 sessions, each session is two hours, and we're gonna cover the, the basics of Ayurvedic herbalism. It's the herb material that is thought to be appropriate for people in their first year of study. So we call it um, Herbalism One, or we have a new name for it um, uh, now, which is uh, I don't know, the story of herbalism or something like that. We just renamed it, uh, but whatever you see anyway, it has a, more, uh, a name with a little more zing. And uh, we'll, we'll spend those 20 hours discussing basically the 20 herbs that our North American herb community, uh, Ayurveda community, would like you to learn as herbalists. They're mainly culinary uh, herbs, herbs that could be used as food. And the sense of the community is that uh, people should get a little bit more Ayurveda training under their belt before they dive into other herbs that are more medicinal. In the second uh, version of that class, Ayurveda 2, and whatever the new more exciting name is, uh, that's, as, that's part of the Certified Ayurveda Practitioner Program. It's going to be the same length, but we'll dive into a whole bunch more different herbs uh, that are not in the initial uh, class. So the first 20, it's 20 individual herbs and three uh, combinations. And actually, at Yoga Veda, we feel like we could uh, include more than just that. So we'll go beyond that. But the basic ones that are required for various certification processes, uh, we will cover. And uh, there are some uh, different certifications in this area done by different professional associations. And so they all pretty much agree on the kinds of herbs that could be discussed. So these are gonna be things like uh, fennel, coriander, um, garlic, uh, uh, ginger, things like that. So these will be things that one could use in food because the main emphasis on year one, the um, health advisor program level is about uh, lifestyle, basic Ayurvedic principles, uh, food, uh, mental processing, uh, things like that, and uh, not so much on herbal medicine. So we get a chance to really dive into those. Just because an herb is culinary and tastes good and can be used in food doesn't mean that it's not medicinal, though. So in higher doses, many of these things can have some pretty profound effects. We'll learn all of that. So for each herb, we'll discuss where it came from, its scientific name, its Ayurvedic energetic properties, how it's used therapeutically, 
uh, many different uses for many of these things, uh, doses and all that sort of information. So we'll spend two hours a day for 10 weeks uh, discussing those things. You'll do a project. There will be a, a test, not a brain busting test, nothing to worry about, but just to make sure that we feel that you're competent with this material. And uh, that's really uh, the bottom line. The three combinations that we'll go into that are I won't say required, but highly recommended by the Ayurveda community uh, in North America are um, Trifala, Trikatu, and Chavampraj, combinations you may have heard of. So uh, they're combinations of commonly involved herbs. Trikatu is the, uh, tri Trifala is the most commonly used combination on planet Earth. So it does something for every organ, every tissue, every person, every circumstance, but it's very, very mild. And so we'll talk about how to use that to treat current acute conditions and also how to support uh, long-term kinds of uh, tissue building and detoxification with that, that. So the most widely consumed combination in the world. Then Trikatu is a combination of three uh, basically culinary herbs, dry ginger, black pepper, and long pepper. And those are all mildly warming. And so we'll talk about those as a circulation aid, a detoxifying remedy, a warming digestive, a remedy, and then the Chavanprash, which is a paste type combination, like an herbal jelly that you can eat off a spoon, stir into liquid, uh, eat on a cracker, anything like that, that again is one of the most widely used in Ayurveda. Chavanprash, that combination, that herbal jelly, contains 35 ingredients. It's mainly a cooked up herbal jelly from a fruit called amla that is widely used in Ayurveda, the most widely used Ayurvedic herb, kind of like making uh, strawberry jelly, but you make it with amla fruit, a medicinal fruit. And then it's got some ghee, some uh, raw sugar, honey, and uh, 20 uh, other uh, herbal ingredients that are stirred in as powders. And that's available all over the world, of course. And that one is uh, not consumed by the most people, but it's the most consumed Ayurvedic uh, substance in uh, India and the Ayurvedic world, which includes some of the countries around India. Uh, in terms of a uh, total dollar spent. So that herbal jelly is uh, about half of the total herb market in the Ayurveda world in terms of money that people are spending, about half of the market. So incredibly popular. Every grandma has it, every grandkid takes it. It's in every cupboard in uh, the Ayurvedic world. So we're going to dive into all those various herbs and then learn a whole lot about herbalism and set the stage for then your further studies, should you choose, choose to do that, about ways to pre prepare and consume herbs and a wide variety of other, those kind of details, who should take them, who shouldn't take them, all of that. So a, a deep dive into a relatively few herbs that the community wants us to know about. Now, again, our attitude is that um, that's a good base and a good set of tools, but there are many other things that we think you could learn to use safely. And so we'll dive into those and we'll talk about um, uh, about half of the body systems in the body by body system. So we'll talk about digestion, uh, respiratory, uh, urinary. And uh, then in year two, we'll dig into the rest of the body systems as we introduce more and more herbs. So it's a two term sequence, but the first term is in the year one material. Again, making sure just that we cover the basics so that should you take one of these credentialing tests, you'll be able to pass that. And then uh, the second one in the second level, which is a year and a half worth of study, the certified Ayurvedic practitioner. Uh, that's our idea. And um, we've done this already a few times at Yoga Veda, and we're ready to dive into that again for any students that are interested in. It is a required part of the uh, advisor program, the first level that takes a year for people to go through and get the credentials if they do all the courses that are mandatory for that within the first year. Okay, that said, uh, questions about any aspect of Ayurvedic herbalism, Ayurveda, or Yoga Veda? This is your chance, Q&A session. Not sure how much more I can tell you about the course and the various herbs that are uh, involved. Uh, tremendous amount you can do with these things. You know, the culinary herbs are, in Ayurveda, there's no distinction between culinary herbs and therapeutic herbs. So 
many of these are excellent grandma herbs. You know, around the world, <clears throat> grandmas handle about 90% of people's health problems, boo-boos, tummy aches, and menstrual cramps, headaches, all of that, constipation, more or less self-limiting things that they could help people feel better uh, with. And they know how to use, uh, you know, 10 to 20 herbs probably, but they know a dozen uses for each of those. The professionals in most traditional medicine systems handle maybe 2% of the problem. So you have the, the family herbalist, the grandma who knows, you know, 10 to 20 herbs, but many ways to use them. That handles all the, the scrapes and lumps and bumps and headaches that people have. Then maybe about 8% are handled by the clan herbalist or the next person up who usually has studied more formally with her grandmother who studied with her grandmother. So that's about 98%. So academically trained professionals like us uh, treat maybe 2%. I see that some of you have chosen to type into the chat, which I wasn't expecting, but I will uh, look at that. Anyway, so uh, about 2% handled by uh, professionals. The typical uh, progression of credentialing, the way we conceive that it's going to go in North America is about a year of a health advisor, basically a health coach kind of training, still fairly in depth, but helping people with things that they could do to make their life better, not treating disease, but supporting health. Then the next year and a half or so is the Ayurvedic practitioner, which begins to train you about treating actual diseases. And then the next uh, two and a half years is the doctorate level. That's the credential that I have. And that's where you're fully trained to handle anything that you could legally handle in North America from an Ayurvedic uh, perspective. So that's the sequence. And <clears throat> this has already been divided into those three educational levels, formally or informally, by the professional Ayurvedic practitioners that are here that are giving such opinions. So there's this consensus that that's the way to go. That's well established. You can take credentialing exams for each of those three uh, levels. So here we're talking about that first level. So question is how I came to be interested in Ayurveda. Uh, yeah, sure. I can tell you all about that. Should you take a break when taking herbs like ashwagandha or safe to take on a daily basis? Absolutely safe to take on a daily basis. This idea of taking a break uh, doesn't appear anywhere in Ayurveda. So ashwagandha is a tonic herb, stamina enhancing, immune building, energizing uh, herb that you can start taking at puberty, basically and take that every day for the rest of your life. So a gram or two would be the tonic dose, the nourishing uh, dose. And it has some, let's call them hormonal actions. So normally we don't wanna give it to prepubescent kids. It's the main tonic for men in Ayurveda. So a man at about age 14, something like could start taking a gram or two and take it for the next uh, 95 years. And it just has slow acting long-term benefits for all, just every tissue in your body. So there's no reason to take a break. These herbs, uh, herbs like ashwagandha are very food-like and you know, no one ever says you have to take a, a break from eating carrots. So they're you know, somewhere kind of the middle of the potency spectrum. Ayurveda thinks of food and medicine as all the same thing. So on one far end, you have herbs that are very medicinally, medicinal only they don't provide any nutrients. There's no point in taking them if you don't need them. They're drug-like, if I could put it that way. So an herb like calamus that we call vacha in Ayurveda would be an herb like that. It treats very specific things. You use it only if you have those things. You take it for a relatively short period of time. On the other end of the spectrum, things you put in your mouth would be things like, like beans and rice that could be used therapeutically, but basically we consume them for their nutrient sources, uh, calories, vitamins, minerals. And then in between, there's a giant gray area where things get increasingly more medicinal. So ashwagandha is somewhere in the middle. It's very food-like in the sense that it acts very slowly. It's tissue building. It's not really intended to treat specific symptoms, although we can use it in higher doses to treat some symptoms like anxiety, works very well to treat anxiety, but it takes about two weeks to kick in and optimize the dose. And we use higher doses short-term for anxiety with ashwagandha. That's just a side benefit. But the bottom line is it's an herb that makes you more solid, juicier, better hormone balance, sexual functioning, immune functioning, and muscular stamina, uh, helps to regulate sleep cycles. As people age, often they begin to have more and more difficulty with sleep. So if you take the ashwagandha, a couple grams every day forever. So no need to take a break. 
the, uh, this idea of taking a break came from our experience with drugs that develop uh, tolerance. So uh, let's say that you're taking uh, a, drug, a drug like Sudafed for your nasal congestion. And you discover that if you don't take it, you have the congestion. Never was intended to take forever, but people do take it forever. So it take it for a few days. You have a cold, take Sudafed. First day dries you up like the desert. Great, no more, no more congestion. A couple of days later, you have to take two pills to get that same effect. A couple of days later, three pills. And if you just keep taking and taking and taking, eventually you get to the place where you can't take enough Sudafed to have the results anymore because your body is accommodated to it. You've developed tolerance. People have this experience with uh, caffeine. So with coffee, uh, when they first drink their first cup of coffee, half a cup plasters them to the ceiling and now they're 50 and they're drinking 10 cups a day and still dragging. You become tolerant to it. So that idea uh, only applies to very few um, Ayurvedic uh, herbs. Um, generally speaking, uh, not. Now, there's a difference between needing to take a break and only using things for a short time. So if we're treating, let's say, a bacterial infection, let's say it's a bacterial sinus infection, we expect to take herbs to knock that out. Our standard would be within a day. Maybe it'll take a couple of days. But if you, if you pick the right herb, the right dose, the right preparation, everything correctly, you should be able to knock out a sinus infection in a day or so. Then probably we treat it for another couple of days just to make sure. And then you're done with that. No point in taking a bug killing herb for the rest of your life because there are no bugs there to kill. It's probably not gonna hurt you, but there's no need for it. So there are a few herbs for which there is some cycling that would be beneficial, some herbs that would be best not to take during menstruation, for example. So some things like that. But this idea that these long-term herbs like ashwagandha, that you need to rotate them or uh, take a break somehow, again, comes from our drug-oriented mindset. Nobody ever told you that you had to rotate celery or take a break from celery. So we could briefly just mention what makes an herb an herbal medicine. And there is no specific definition. Uh, in Ayurveda, especially so, it's a non-question because Ayurveda says that um, there is no substance that's right for everybody and there's uh, some substance that's right for somebody. So even the, mo the things that we would think of as poison can be used as medicines. In fact, Ayurveda says the best medicines make the best poisons and the best poisons make the best medicines. In other words, things that act very powerfully if they're used properly in the proper dose can be very effective. So there's no distinction between food and medicine. We think of, you know, when I, I am known in the herb world as a missionary for turmeric. In fact, people that have known me for a while, they, they call me Haldi Baba. That's my nickname. Haldi is turmeric and Baba is like a respected elder. And uh, I first, I learned about turmeric 50 years ago. I've been practicing for 50 years, five zero. And I learned one of the first herbs I learned about, I began to use it clinically and it was so effective that I just began talking about it to everybody and, and giving talks at conferences and writing articles and things. And at the time, tumor, the only use that Americans knew for turmeric was to color mustard. And so I, you know, I would meet with some holistic medical doctor and say, by the way, turmeric is super good and be like, wait a minute, that's just a dye for mustard. Why do you care about that? I feel very validated now because turmeric is the most, or curcumin specifically, the active ingredient from turmeric is the most researched substance in the history of science. Tens of thousands of papers have been written on that one substance, the most researched substance ever in the history of science. So I feel uh, vindicated from that. Anyway, there's an example of something that in India, most people think of it as well, just somehow generally good for you. And the average Indian person eats one to two grams a day of turmeric for 90 years. And that's probably the reason for a lot of benefits that they that they experience. So uh, just because these herbs, we just think of them as condiments basically or flavoring agents, they're in fact uh, often quite potent if we use the, or quite effective, let's say, if we use the right amount. Now sometimes we have to use a little more. So anyway, the herbs that we use for medicine have chemical constituents. The herbs we use in for culinary uses, flavoring, have chemical constituents and so do foods. Generally speaking, across the wide range of plants, those constituents are pretty similar. So 
you have things that occur in a lot of different plants. Plants make very similar chemicals over and over of the half a million species of plants that are in the world. Uh, they all make a similar group, thousands of them, but a similar group of constituents. We've been eating plants since there were humans, and so our body has evolved with them and figured out how to use them. So our body can process the constituents in things that we think of as herbal medicine, just like it processes things that are that are in uh, culinary and food. It's just that they're more potent, more concentrated. So they're more convenient to take. And instead of having to drink, eat a whole meal of something to get a little bit of a constituent, you can take a few grams of it to get more of that constituent, just more convenient. That's it. Anyway, so no one told us that we had to, to rotate you know, these things, uh, not necessary, uh, generally speaking. Now, speaking of that, speaking of India, the whole focus on turmeric started because uh, scientists were looking at some health statistics from India. India has very, very low rates of degenerative diseases. Modern India certainly has their problems in terms of delivering health care and, and social status and such things. It's a country that has resource problems. But health-wise, uh, they're tackling still things like typhoid and cholera. But chronic degenerative diseases are way, way low. India has the lowest rates of cancer uh, in the world. And some of cancers, breast cancer, prostate cancer, uh, colon cancer, are 20 times lower than the rates in the United States. 20 times, not 20%, 20 times. Pretty shocking. Uh, dementia is at the rate, Alzheimer's disease specifically, is at a rate of one-eighth, 12% of the United States, one of the lowest rates in the world. We, we're in the top five for Alzheimer's. So scientists began to look at that whole situation and say, well, what do uh, people in India do that we don't do here? Of course, the answer to that is uh, everything. So you've got a different climate, uh, different soil, different types of foods, food preparation, uh, ethnicity, and just everything is different. So the scientists said, well, they eat those things that they call curries. Those are yellow. They have that turmeric stuff in them. Maybe we should look at that. And fortunately, they took a look and then they, it was very effective against cancer. And then they said, well, what's the magic bullet in typical reductionist scientific style and decided that it was curcumin and now have done these tens of thousands of studies on the curcumin. Our idea scientifically in outside of India is uh, to find the, the one constituent that's the hidden you know, magic bullet there. But it, with turmeric, they really hit the bullseye. So turmeric has been chosen to benefit. This was from the Baylor College of Medicine in uh, Texas, one of the leading research institutes in the United States. They issued a public service announcement about uh, two years ago, I guess now, uh, saying that they tested curcumin on a hundred types of cancer, each one at all four stages. And they didn't find a single cancer at any stage that curcumin didn't benefit. So sometimes the benefits were minimal, sometimes they were substantial. But I mean, that's really saying something to find one constituent from a plant that treats 400 examples of a cancer. So they began to look further into these, into the low rates of degenerative disease in India. And they began to conclude that it was the use of these tropical spices in total that provided this benefit, not just turmeric. That was the one they kind of seized on 40 years ago and went crazy with. But cinnamon, black pepper, all these things have immune enhancing constituents. And some of them taste good. So people put them in food and just a little bit every day. The average Indian eats an additional gram or two of tropical spices. And turmeric's the most common, but uh, black pepper, cinnamon, uh, ginger, uh, and they're largely antioxidant. And so that made a huge uh, difference. Okay, so I, um, any herbs to remedy hand tremors? Yeah, well, let me mention two herbs. Uh, the first is an herb that's actually not an Ayurvedic herb. It's a, a, a North American herb, and that herb is skullcap probably the most famous herb in the world for this function. Skullcap grows east of the Mississippi River, uh, concentration up in New England, that area, maybe down in, into as far as Ohio, but that general area. Um, it's a plant that grows in the, the uh, forests, on the forest floor, and we use the above ground portion, the herbaceous portion, leaf and stem, 
very easily available in any from any herb store. And it's it, a lot of science on this actually about reducing uh, tremors. So it has constituents that reduce every kind of movement disorder, uh, chorea, tremors, tics, seizures, just across the board. So very generally very good. Uh, I don't know anything about your case, but I'm just saying that this herb is uh, likely to work. It's worth a try. It's very safe, easily available. I would use it as a tea. It's available in tincture form. Western herbalists like to use it in tincture form, but to get the doses high enough to begin to affect something like an observable hand tremor, uh, the doses are gonna have to go up. So I would suggest the dose is probably gonna end up being about 30 grams. That's 30 grams by weight of the dried herb brewed into tea. So you don't wanna take that dose the first day. So I would start with you know two or three grams brewed into tea, drink that tea if everything is okay. Go up by you know three to five grams a day, something like that, until either it begins to affect a hand tremor or you get to 30 grams. And if there's no side effect problems or issues, continue with the tea made from 30 grams of dried raw herb for a while and see if that uh, has an effect and then continue. And probably if you begin to get some result after a month or two, you could begin to slowly bring the dose down and find out what dose prevented the tremors and um, then continue that way. Now, uh, skull cap is sedating. So most people, when they're sort of up and around and moving and alert, it's not too much of an issue. They kind of feel a little calmer maybe, but it doesn't make them sleepy. But just be aware of that issue. So one way around that might be to take the bolt, to spread the doses out through the day. So maybe take a bit with breakfast, another mid-morning, lunch, mid-afternoon, uh, dinner, but also then maybe push it back toward the end of the day a little bit more so that your dinner dose or your uh, evening dose was a little higher so that you're, you don't have sleepiness during the day. The other herb is an Ayurvedic herb. That herb is it, Gota Kola, G-O-T-U-K-O-L-A, probably the most famous nerve herb in the world. It's not specific for tremors, but it's generally beneficial. My specialty in practice is neurology. So I deal with these brain things and nerve things all the time. And I focus on um, epilepsy, migraine, autism, trigeminal neuralgia, that sort of thing. It's most of what I do in practice, although I, I have a general practice as well. And I see people with all kinds of issues, but go to cola is uh, probably the herb that I use the most in the neurological side of my practice. I just love it. It does, it really delivers. Now, again, it's a relatively mild herb. The probably the best healer of the actual brain and nerve tissue itself, and then also enhances cognition, intellect, memory, that sort of thing. Again, a lot of good science on Godokola. The Ayurvedic name for Godokola is Brahmi, which means godlike. In other words, to give you a mind like God, it's pretty good. So again, that dose of Godokola uh, typically would be in the 30 gram range, like we talked about with the skull cap, relatively mild, work your way up over a few days, 30 grams of dried raw herb that's cooked into tea. You filter it out, you drink that tea. Uh, go to cola is not sedating, so you can use it pretty much any time. On the other hand, it's not as specific for uh, tremors. Uh, the nightshade nature of ashwagandha. Yeah, so ashwagandha is a nightshade. Uh, nightshades are uh, plants. It's a family of plants, the Solanaceae family, that grow in Asia and uh, the Western Hemisphere. So if we go back to the uh, Ayurvedic text, the classic texts that we use that were written about 2,500 years ago, there was no knowledge of the fact that all these plants were related botanically. That's a new development in the last 400 years. So there are many nightshades that are used in Ayurveda and recommended. Uh, eggplant is a food that is a nightshade that's widely used in Ayurveda. Uh, and then of course, ashwagandha and several others. So it's the Acharyas, the authors of these classical texts, didn't make a distinction and didn't rule out nightshades by any means. Now in the Western hemisphere, people discovered indigenous plants that were being used, tomatoes, potatoes, chilies, um, and tobacco are all nightshades. So when those things came to India, some were embraced and some weren't. And this is a whole discussion about cultural and political issues and medical issues and who embraced what. But 
Anyway, um, eggplants are native to India. Tomatoes, a close relative, are native to the Western Hemisphere. So tomatoes were not embraced by Ayurveda as medicine, but they were embraced by Indian culture as cooking for food. And so there's a number of these kind of disparities. Uh, nightshades have a, um, a toxin in them. Uh, there's no doubt that that toxin is there. There's no doubt it's poisonous. Everybody agrees. Just a question of dose and how your body will deal with that. So some people are especially sensitive to that nightshade toxin. And so if they eat, let's say, tomatoes, uh, they have some symptom. It's usually joint pain. That's usually the symptom. So often people with a high vata energy in their body uh, have pain from tomatoes. Tomatoes is the big offender. And largely that's because, for one thing, the toxin concentrates in the fruit. And also when you eat tomatoes, you often have a chance to eat a lot of tomatoes because the, let's say you're making pizza, it takes a lot of tomatoes to cook down to make the tomato sauce for the pizza. So one slice of pizza may have the, the sauce may be equal to several tomatoes. So people notice that if they eat a bunch of tomatoes, they might have some joint pain. And for some people that applies to potatoes and, and um, chilies, you know, as well. Ashwagandha, number one, it's uh, the root. So that seems to be less of an issue. I have never seen nightshade reactions to ashwagandha. Uh, that doesn't mean it doesn't happen. And some of my colleagues claim to have seen it, but it's much, much less of a culprit than uh, tomatoes. Uh, so there are people in the Ayurveda world who feel like we with our evolved Ayurveda knowledge should decide that all nightshades should not be consumed. Now, of course, that would include ashwagandha and some other well-known Ayurvedic medicines. So that that's a little bit, you know, maybe that's an over-exaggeration. My perspective is that if people are affected by these things, you know, you're a high vata person with osteoarthritis and you eat tomatoes and it bothers you, then don't eat them. Uh, but others have a more general prohibition against them. Most people feel like ashwagandha is probably okay and they pick on tomatoes. And, you know, some Ayurvedic practitioners say that uh, white potato is the only nightshade that's suitable. It's all over the place. And again, the idea is that the writers of the text didn't have a way of knowing that these were all botanically uh, related. And so there are at least another half dozen commonly used Ayurvedic herbs in the nightshade family that generally people don't even talk about one way or the other. So it's, um, it's a, an exaggerated internet phenomenon as so many are these days where there's a kernel of truth to it, but some people decide somewhere somehow that it's the worst thing you could ever do, blog about it, that gets re-blogged re and re-blogged and now it's a thousand blogs saying that, which makes it seem credible because, hey, a thousand people published it, but it's just re-blogging you know, over and over. It's, it's a challenge these days. So we do have the folks that wrote our main texts we have a, a group of three that were written around 2,500 um, years ago, about 500 BCE. And we have another group that were written about 1,000 CE. And of those, there are six total. And those are the main texts that we use. Now there are thousands of books written in Indian history about Ayurveda. But every one of these teachers says, we're not the final word on anything. All we're doing is telling you what we know now. You'll know more in the future. And they very poetically say, we're leaving the last page of this book blank so that the next generation can write their insights and they'll do the same and knowledge will continue to grow. So my perspective is that there's no limit to Ayurveda. And if you ask me what is and is not Ayurveda, I would say everything is Ayurveda. Could we use modern drugs Ayurvedically? Yes. Could we use foods and herbs that Ayurvedic practitioners had never heard of or were not in any of those books? Yes. So that gives the, those books give us the basic foundation of a way to understand how the human body and mind works, but it's not limited. So as we discover more things, you know, I, be, I may become a, uh, an opponent of nightshades in the future as we get more research. If I can be, it can be proven to me that it poisons everybody, I'll tell everybody to stop eating tomatoes. But right now it's an interesting idea that like with most things, the truth is probably somewhere in the middle I've seen so much good from ashwagandha. You know, my uh, my friend Michael Tierra was telling me the other day that in 1970, 
he was in India as a uh, hitchhiking hippie tourist. And somehow he found himself uh, in a taxi cab uh, with three noted Ayurvedic physicians, uh, somehow, you know, coincidence. And he, he asked a question that now looking back, he kind of gives an eye roll how naive I was to ask a question like this. But he said, uh, what's the most important, important herb in Ayurveda? He was already a practicing herbalist from a Western perspective. And all three of them together said ashwagandha. Now, they, they could have said another, you know, 10 different herbs, but they all said ashwagandha. So he thought that was a sign. But yeah, ashwagandha has now become a 50 year overnight sensation. He and I both have been using it for 50 years and it became the herb of the year in the health food industry last year. So, you know, the, there's no telling which of these ideas is trendy and has merit and which ones are just faddish and, you know, uh, whatever. Okay, so strict vegetarian, how, how does Ayurveda cope with this? Uh, yeah, Ayurveda is a medical system, not a moral or ethical system. Ayurveda want, encourages you to have uh, a moral system, to have thought through moral issues in your life and act ethically, but it doesn't tell you which of those, what the answer is and how, what you should decide about that. So it just gives you the evidence, says this is what will happen under certain circumstances, and you can decide how you want to handle that. Um, I'm also a lifelong vegetarian, and uh, you know I'm an Ayurvedic uh, practitioner, but Ayurveda in and of itself doesn't uh, expect everybody to be vegetarian, and in fact is willing to use meat as an emergency measure, uh, as a medicine, basically. Now, I typically don't do that because I think we can get what we need without doing that, but if people are already eating meat, okay, we can steer them in certain, certain directions. Um, Ayurveda does come from a culture that today is primarily vegetarian. Uh, 2,500 years ago, it wasn't. But Ayurveda um, values the contributions of a plant-based diet and talks about the possible negative and positive uses of every substance they've ever studied. Every milk from every mammal, every type of plant, every type of flesh from every, you know, from every animal, they have qualities that can be used according to your discussion. So today, uh, most people in India, about um, two thirds are people who we might call Hindus. They wouldn't use that word. That's a word that the British brought to describe people in India. Uh, so people who practice Vedic philosophy, let's say, about two thirds. Um, the, the other third is made up of all kinds of other smaller groups. You got about 20% Muslims in the population. They generally speaking are not vegetarian whatsoever. Uh, you've got uh, Christians in the South primarily. They're typically not vegetarian. You've got a few Jewish people from all the way back from the Jewish diaspora that's settled there. And again, probably not vegetarian, Zoroastrians, um, Sikhs. Got a bunch of people who may or may not choose to be vegetarian. But uh, of the people practicing uh, Vedic philosophies, about uh, one third are, they're, they're all theoretically vegetarian. That system does say, look, it's better to be vegetarian. And it has very specific teachings about that. Uh, about one third are um, strict uh, vegetarians. Uh, they follow those religious rules and they're serious about it. Just like in any religion, you got people that follow the rules more carefully than others. So about one third of that group would be, let's say, orthodox. Um, another third would be flexitarian, plant-based, but willing to eat a little bit of meat if it showed up somehow. You know, they were invited to dinner and there was chicken in the in the soup base. They, you know, they'd eat it. Uh, the other third are um, omnivores and would eat anything anytime. So there's a general vegetarian positive uh, sense in India. And of course, cows are, it's illegal to slaughter cows in India, anywhere in India. Um, that creates a kind of a weird social dynamic because half of the cows, half of the animals born are bulls and they don't, they're not gonna give milk and you're gonna keep the occasional bull for reproduction and maybe to, uh, to pull some carts or something but where do the rest of them go? Mm -hmm. They seem to just kind of disappear during the night somehow. Uh, but anyway, there's you know, this whole situation about how can you have the bull calves dealt with? And then what about the cows that no longer give milk? 
they seem to kind of slip away. So anyway, uh, people are not going to eat beef. It's definitely not, even carnivores are not going to, because even if they were willing to, definitely not socially appropriate. So McDonald's in India has chicken burgers. The poor chickens are the ones who really, you know, get the hammer in India. If you're going to eat flesh, it's almost always chickens and then goats, those two. So uh, anyway, uh, yeah, a primarily vegetarian culture, at least superficially for most uh, for most people. Well, I'll tell you a little bit about my story. So I um, started investigating uh, natural medicine when I was a teenager, and it was the hippie times, and everybody was uh, in looking into all these new ideas, Eastern philosophies, different kinds of diets, macrobiotic diet, yoga, all that stuff, brand new, like an avalanche coming in. And uh, so I was uh, enthralled with all that kind of stuff and investigating, and um, herbal medicine became part of that whole you know, investigation, and I just found myself very interested in uh, herbal medicine in particular, but I began studying all the, the background of uh, yoga, uh, the diet, the lifestyle, all of that. The, it was incredibly minimal what we could learn at the time. So we, we would spend a lot of time just, you know, searching for scraps of something. There were no books, very few teachers. The teachers of yoga and Ayurveda were you know more or less fresh off the boat. They often didn't speak English very well. They often had a teaching style that was impenetrable to uh, you know Americans. But one way or another, we stuck with it and we began learning uh, these sorts of things and you know putting it together. And I started practice um, in my early years of college when I was still a teenager. Um, I, of course, comparison to today, knew very little. And health food stores in those days were the size of your closet. There were uh, there, a bottle of alfalfa pills on one side and a bag of wheat germ on the other, and that was it. But anyway, there was a health food store right next to the campus of the college I was going to. And uh, I said, can I do consultations in your back room? And they said, yeah, sure, you can use it for free because they knew that the things that I would recommend, my clients would just walk up to the front and they could buy them there. And so we had a symbiotic relation. I did that for a while. I would talk to my fellow hippies who were always down for this sort of thing. And um, I would have my clients there. And then I continued to expand my practice um, you know, at that time. And gradually more and more teachers came and books started to be written. Um, I've written 31 books now. So we you know, started to write articles for health food magazines. I've written over 3000 of those articles and slowly but surely it began to fill in. Well, now 50 years later, we're at this place where we have great schools like Yoga Veda and we have plenty of books written in a style that you know, are understandable to uh, North American uh, people. I acknowledge that some of you may not, Yoga Veda has a wide reach. And so some of you may not be from North America. That's where I live. That's why I keep saying that. But a lot of you, I think maybe are in the Caribbean. We have some, a lot of students from there often. So schools like this began to pop up and then gradually educational standards and you know things like that. Um, so, that I was practicing initially in Eugene, Oregon, which is where I went to college. And it's where I'm, I'm back to now, actually, after many, many years away, I now have returned to Eugene for other reasons. But anyway, I practiced there. Then I went to Mexico City to go to graduate school. And I practiced there uh, for a while, had a very successful practice. There were two holistic healers in all of Mexico City when I lived there. There were plenty of indigenous healers, and I learned a lot from them. But the, in terms of sort of modern holistic style, there was one chiropractor who was American and me, and I was practicing Ayurveda style stuff. And he, uh, you know, neither of us were licensed in Mexico, but it was a casual situation. And so we both, we referred back and forth and we had good, both had good practices. Then I moved to Seattle, Washington, uh, again, to continue uh, graduate work and um, began practicing there and then continued. Uh, eventually, I ended up uh, moving back to Eugene, Oregon, which had to do with my daughter's education. It, would, it had nothing to do with my, my uh, previous you know, life here, but that's where I'm based uh, now. So I teach for Yoga Veda as a faculty member, and of course, we have many other excellent faculty members, and I typically teach two classes per term. So this year, we're in the um, in the process of a three-term uh, series on pathology. We're just about to finish up winter term, which was our first 
uh, pathology class, and then we'll start, we'll have the next one. Uh, that class, by the way, you know, I don't want to speak for Yoga Veda. I don't know if they're requiring it to be taken in sequence. It doesn't have to be. I'm not quite sure exactly where we are there. If you have the qualifications to do that and you want to join us, you could check with them. I don't think it needs to be in sequence, but they would make that decision. And then um, we're just finishing up a Panchakarma class uh, this term. And then, of course, the herb course uh, is going to take the place of that. And then, you know, a few other things here and there, but usually over the four terms, teaching two classes per uh, term. So I um, was an officer in the American Herbalist Guild for 20 years, uh, eventually becoming the president. And I was the, um, the president, the, the last president before the current one, the penultimate president. And uh, I was also on the board of directors of the National Ayurvedic Medical Association, uh, NAMA, with which um, Yoga Veda is, um, you know, in connection. And the, the relationship has changed a little bit over time. I don't want to speak for them. I'm not quite sure what the, where Yoga Veda is in that process, but that's the one of the professional associations that's out there that represents the practice of Ayurveda. There are some other ones and there's some sort of dynamic things happening with um, split offs and rejoining and things like that of those organizations. So that's a whole political situation. Not quite sure where Yoga Veda is with that. I'm just a humble hired teacher. So I uh, teach these classes largely in um, uh, for Yoga Veda, just, you know, herbal medicine, as I said, and these other kinds of uh, classes. Uh, from a personal point of view, uh, when I was age 10, uh, I began having back pain and it became more and more persistent. And I came from a medical family and went to the medical doctor, couldn't figure it out. We ended up going to about 10 orthopedists. Um, none of them could figure it out. Finally, we went to a doctor who had studied in Germany and was practicing in the United States. And he figured out what it was and gave it a name that nobody else could give. And he said, this is inevitably progressive. No one lives past age 40 with this disease and just don't get addicted to morphine too early because you're gonna need a lot later. Well, at 10 years old, it doesn't really penetrate very well. And so I just, you know, more or less continued with my life and my back was hurting more and more uh, every year, but I just bucked up and went through it. So I, I did, you know, backpacking and sports and all those things, but my back was killing me all the time. So by the time I was about 16 in high school, I was uh, in pain every waking moment and um, it was still degenerating. Then I, the, the first relief I ever got was in a yoga class. I was in the yoga class because I was interested in the spiritual side of yoga, but we were doing physical postures and we did an exercise that left me pain-free for about 15 minutes, which is the first time in six years that that had happened, or now it would be eight years that that had happened. And I said, well, if there's one thing that this alternative medicine stuff can do for my back, there might be other things. And so I began investigating. I originally wasn't didn't become interested in ayurveda and yoga because of my own condition as far as i knew i was going to degenerate and die by age 40. that's what an army of doctors had told me um, but I, looking back it's pretty clear that mine was the journey of the wounded healer like so many others and that i was subconsciously motivated to you know to pursue this so when i got interested in it originally it was just a fascination with new things um, you know, health food stores had just started stocking this marvelous new thing called tofu. You know, when I when I was buying tofu when I was a teenager, uh, there'd be a big barrel of water, like an old pickle barrel kind of thing in the health food store. You'd reach your arm in, grab a block of tofu, stick your plastic bag down in there and get a bunch of tofu water, put your block in there, seal the bag and carry your tofu block home in a bag of water. So, you know, brown rice, I mean, what all these different things that we were interested in just because it was new and different and herbal medicine was definitely part of that. And I began having some early successes, not so much with myself, but with other people. But as I began to uh, perfect my skills a little bit better, then I began to experience some of these benefits. It took a lot longer then than it did now, but by the time I was um, finished with college, I was out of pain and it's never come back. And if you look at an X-ray of my spine, it looks perfectly, perfectly normal now. And you might be able to tell I'm a little bit past 40, uh, only barely though. And I now have passed that threshold. 
when I was uh, a few years ago, I had a colleague who said, hey, I have a patient with your original diagnosis. Uh, if you want to go meet this guy, he was in the hospital and he was going to die in the hospital. He would never leave the hospital. And they had snipped his spinal, ner uh, spinal nerves, the nerves that come out of the spine to innervate the rest of the body. They'd snipped every one. So he had no feeling in the, the periphery of his body. He was lying in bed, basically waiting to die. I mean, they were trying, they were keeping him as long, alive as long as they could, but his spine was just degenerating. And, you know, that would have been me without these kinds of things. So I was very interested originally in yoga because of its philosophical side. Then I became interested in the physical side. And then of course, Ayurveda was the next step. Interestingly, the Ayurveda world and the yoga world uh, do not mesh very well today. Strangely enough, most of the people who become Ayurveda students, maybe not so much now, and maybe not so much in Yoga Veda because it's got yoga in the name and they're a yoga organization as well. But I just thought, gosh, everybody who does yoga is going to want to know the medical side. And it's just going to be a wave of, you know, as yoga became more popular, I just figured, hey, everybody's going to want to study Ayurveda too. Didn't happen. And in fact, the two worlds collided somewhat and became somewhat, um, you know, aggressive toward each other. And so the, uh, the Ayurveda community, you know, heard uh, some things from the yoga community that like, you know, we don't want your Ayurveda. We're, we're about posture and breathing and, you know, don't keep bugging us about this. Uh, anyway, I think maybe it's becoming a bit more integrated uh, now, but most Ayurveda students, again, maybe not in this school, but generally speaking, come from the world of natural healing in general. They might be nutritionists who are interested in a you know, different approach or Chinese medical practitioners or Western herbalists or whatever, but they come from that, the practice side of health management at, uh, and not from the uh, yoga side. Um, so I don't know what's, uh, what happened there, but somehow that happened anyway. I, I think maybe now we're at the place where it's integrated. Um, I will tell you that um, it's really exciting to see, I mean, the fact that we could have a, even have a school like Yoga Veda uh, is very encouraging. Um, I thought the, the moment I began to learn these things, I, and especially when I, I became healed, I just said, this stuff is so fantastic. Everybody's going to want to know about it immediately. And I just expected within, you know, very short time, the whole world would turn on to natural medicine. <laughs> Obviously, that didn't happen. Maybe we're there now. Maybe we've sort of reached a critical mass where enough people have a positive experience that they're, you know, now wanting to study and participate. It's been a slow go, but uh, here we are, and hopefully, maybe it's kind of, you know, uh, in becoming more permanent now. As the medical system gets more and more busted, uh, that's probably a lot of people's motivation. I know a lot of my clients are just like, I've never heard of this Ayurveda stuff, but I just can't stand going to my medical doctor. Everything about it is bothersome from you know insurance to waiting three hours in the waiting room to being hustled in and out, waiting two hours in an exam room and get, then getting a three minute appointment and a pres hurried prescription as a doctor goes out of the room backwards. It's just not working for people. So they're looking for new opportunities and that's where you come in. Um, we are, what we're here to talk about is this Ayurveda class that's coming up. And of course this is being recorded. So presumably you'll have access to it. Those of you that came in a little later uh, anyway, the, um, the whole idea of training as an Ayurvedic practitioner, can you make a living doing it? Well, the answer is yes. Uh, and it, it's designed for self-motivated people. So there is no defined career path for an Ayurvedic uh, health advisor. Um, you have to figure out where you're going to fit into the system somehow. I had no grand plan. There was no way to do it. Uh, I opened up a multidisciplinary uh, clinic in Seattle, the first one ever in Seattle, and ran that for 20 years. That was very difficult to do because even though it was clear in my mind that it was a good idea, it was a generation too early. Now that idea is uh, common. And so that might be a place that you could take this information and you would be the Ayurveda voice in a holistic clinic. You could talk to people about Ayurvedic practice or for diet and herbalism and, you know, whatever. Um, I've seen some people do very, very well uh, financially and uh, in terms of their uh, 
their profession with this kind of training has to do more with your persistence and paying attention to all the other factors of how to run a business to be successful. So I encourage you to investigate all those other kinds of uh, the non-therapeutic side of the whole thing. So that's what's going to, if, if you get that part down and you know, we'll train you to be good technicians, that's not a problem. The issue is, can you apply it in the real world? And some people find that they can and others not. So be aware of that right from the beginning and focus on how that's all going to work and come up with something. And during class, we can talk about that because I've trained generations now of practitioners. It's the only uh, career I've ever had. And I've been able to make a good living, send my kids to school. You know, I own my own, own fully paid off house, all of that. So we know that you can do it. The question is, uh, you know, actually just doing it. So during class, if we have questions about those kinds of things, those are good things to discuss, uh, not just the being a technician in terms of which herbs to take when for what. Uh, okay, well, that's all the um, questions that are in the chat. Now, after having all those, uh, me making all those comments, are there questions from anybody? You're welcome to use your microphone. But you'd rather type into the chat. What reduces the size of thyroid nozzles? Uh, nodules. Okay, so folks, so here's the thing about this is that these Q&A sessions often get into this where people want to know about their own conditions and want me to prescribe through Zoom. It's not really very, I, I did give a couple ideas earlier about some other, you know, other things in very generally. So I'm willing to make general comments about conditions, but I can't go into your particular case. So the person asking this is uh, asking about her own uh, personal case. But I will tell you a very um, classic Ayurvedic treatment for thyroid nodules is a combination called Kunchnar Google. Let me type that into the chat. Kunchnar Google. So kunchnar is the herb that uh, has action on masses and in particular thyroid masses, but that's the most famous uh, combination in Ayurveda for uh, thyroid masses. Now, uh, presumably one would have these thoroughly checked out medically and make sure that they're benign. You don't want to allow thyroid cancer to go you know, untreated. Uh, Google is a, a, a very potent uh, detoxifier in Ayurveda. It's one of the most famous and it treats all the tissues, organs, structures of the body, goes very deep and removes waste material. And uh, Google there is about half of that formula. And then the Kunchnar is another chunk of the formula. It has a few other ancillary herbs that help it do its job. But that would be the most famous one in um, Ayurveda for thyroid masses, benign thyroid masses. Uh, could Ayurveda treat thyroid cancer? Uh, yeah, probably. Uh, given all the right circumstances. Um, I don't treat cancer at all. Um, the, the treatment of cancer with natural medicine is uh, such a specialty that you have to devote your entire career to just that. I chose not to do that. I wanted to do other, other things. So I don't know much about cancer. Um, so I don't know about, I don't know what the answer would be to does, thyroid, does Ayurveda treat thyroid cancer, but certainly Ayurveda could be complementary to conventional uh, treatment, and that we certainly do and could do. So Kunchnar might be involved in that. Anyway, that should be easily available from the world of Ayurvedic uh, supplements, probably even on Amazon, and one could, uh, could try that. Yeah, again, so don't construe any of this as individual uh, medical advice, because I know nothing about your case except one sentence on a chat. So I'm giving very general facts about these things we know from Ayurveda. Other concerns, uh, questions, issues? Hi, um, I'm sorry I missed the, the first uh, few minutes. I'm not sure if you went over this, but what kind of assignments are um, part of the class? Assignments, you're saying? Yes. Yeah, well, there's one big assignment 
And uh, that assignment is to pick some condition in your body and treat it yourself with something that you've learned in class and do that for at least a week and write it up. Many people do for longer, but that's the one assignment. So there's a project and a test. Uh, the other assignments are just reading assignments. And so we have one book that is uh, uh, assigned to be read as the textbook for the class. And then we have another alternate that you can uh, add if you, if you like. I'll give you um, multitudinous handouts uh, that you can read for background uh, information. So there's a lot to read should you choose to, but otherwise it's reading one textbook, doing a project and uh, taking the test, that's it. And what's the textbook for the class? You know, why don't you check with Yoga Veda about that? I don't want to make a mistake and uh, guide you in the wrong direction. So um, we'll, these sort of administrative questions probably should go to them to make sure that, you know, I give you the proper answer. Can I ask a question? Uh, sure. Can I, oh, yes, uh, yes, uh, I am Eliane and I am uh, an arborist. And uh, since five years, I give workshops and I followed the course with uh, Rosalie, Taste of Herbs, and uh, I learn about the five elements. And each day I learn about herbs and uh, I'm 65 years old, but I would like to, uh, uh, to become a better and a better and a better herb. Herborist, and I am very interested in Ayurveda because I was for uh, in the ashram in uh, with Sai Baba, and uh, I'm very in interested in Ayurveda. But my question is, which course would help me the best to to make uh, further steps in my evolu evolution? as an herbalist. I don't speak very well English. <laughs> no, I, you're perfectly understandable. Um, yeah, the, this, the Ayurveda course, uh, not the uh, herbal, Ayurvedic herbalism course that we're talking about specifically here is one course for one term. It's part of a larger program. You don't have to be enrolled as far as I know. Now, again, you need to check with Yoga Veda, but as far as I know, you can take the herb course uh, independently. So if you have extensive herb background, Rosalie is a former student of mine, and I know her uh, very well, not from the Ayurveda side, but more from the herbalism uh, side. And so you have a good background in these kinds of ideas and energetic herbalism. You talked about five elements. So uh, you could probably fit right into the Ayurvedic herb class uh, as a, a specific individual course, should you choose to. But you can oh. check. You can check with uh, Yoga Veda about whether that's allowed. It's intended to be part of, you know, the whole package. But so, you know, I, again, I don't want to make a mistake and say something inappropriate about their administration. But they're very good. You, they're quite responsive. You can uh, connect with them on their website through uh, customer service department, and they'll let you know whether, uh, you know, whether that's possible. But that should be fine. We're not going to discuss. We are going to be using Ayurvedic vocabulary, Ayurvedic concepts. It's going to be all Ayurveda all the time. Although, again, we will talk about a very few non-Indian herbs in that class, mainly Indian herbs. But uh, it should all be pretty understandable to just about anybody, really, especially anybody with any background in herbal medicine. Uh, can I uh, ask uh, a second question? Because I'm, uh, I live in Europe. And um, uh, uh, I'm very interested in Ayurveda uh, because I feel it, but uh, I would like to work with uh, herbs from my, in, in, it must not be from India. Um, uh, in, in my view, uh, Ayurveda is also uh, 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 important to to work with the herbs uh, of uh, your your country. Uh, do you understand? Sure. Yeah. Well, Ayurvedic ideas could be applied to any herb from anywhere, and the herb doesn't know where it's yeah. growing. Yes. And so, yeah, I, I'm perfectly comfortable with that. The only reason that we're 
focusing almost entirely on Indian herbs in this class is because that's what the North American Ayurvedic community wants us to do. That's not my decision. And so for whatever reason, they feel like we should begin the process at least with um, Asian herbs only. And in fact, many people would say uh, that Ayurveda is only Indian herbs and that we should only teach about Indian herbs. Um, so even our uh, next level course is mainly uh, Indian herbs. But yeah, you could take these principles and apply them to European herbs, absolutely. Oh yes, oh yes, that I can do, yes. So yeah. uh, for my question, I have to to take uh, contact with the administration. administration. Yeah, just communicate with um, the administration of Yoga Veda and they'll tell you yeah. what the rules are about which class you can sign up for. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you very much, very, yeah. very much. The, as far as I know, the classes at Yoga Veda are all a la carte, meaning you take each class individually when you sign up for it. And what you're doing is assembling all of the requirements for that first year credential. So some people do take every class when it's offered and get that, that one year credential after the one year. Others kind of pick and choose for a while and it takes longer than the year to get through it and then they get that credential. That's the basic intention. But as far as I know, you could take any of these classes. Now, some of them require some uh, uh, prerequisites or have to be taken in sequence in some way. Uh, and so again, you can check with them about that. But other than that, as far as I know, you can take any of the classes. I don't wanna to go too far into this because I don't wanna mislead you. I actually don't know the details of all which classes are which. But as far as the herb class, um, there's nothing that would prevent most people from taking it. Um, there may be some sort of a foundation course or something that they require, and you can ask them about that. Uh, again, though, we will be using Ayurvedic vocabulary and Ayurvedic concepts, but it's easy just to, to discuss those in class. If we're using some Ayurvedic language that somebody doesn't understand, we can just, you know, talk about it, and it should be understandable to everybody. Okay, folks, looks like our questions are winding down. Um, last minute questions or concerns from anybody? Looks like not. Always a pleasure to be with you. Hope our paths cross again. I'll be around. Uh, probably you folks will be around. If I meet you in class, uh, we can reconnect there. So have a good uh, rest of your day, everyone.